Welcome to this week's Torah portion is Parshas Truma, and we're learning inside this edition of the Chumash, the Kahasid, new Kahas edition of, uh, of Chumash. And this week we're going to learn about the building of the tabernacle, the Mishkan, in the desert. Now, the Mishkan in the desert was a precursor to the building of the Holy Temple that was built later on by King Solomon in the holy city of Jerusalem in the Holy Land. And this is something that has significance to the entire world because God Almighty says that my house of prayer is called a house of prayer for all the nations. And there are we're going to learn about the setup of the structure that was used in the temple, that the way the tabernacle was created. The tabernacle then not only was the precursor, but the actual structure of the holy temple uh, was very much very close to that of the, or the layout, shall we say, was very much like that of the tabernacle. So whatever we're going to learn here is going to give us an introduction to the concept of what the holy temple is, uh, is like and what it's about. And so... It's a, it's a tremendous opportunity that God Almighty has given the Jewish people to build a house of prayer, a focal point of service of God Almighty that's a, a focal point for every single human being. In fact, when we pray, our prayers are intended to be directed towards the Holy of Holies in the Holy Temple, uh, in the Holy City, in the Holy Land. And wherever we are in the world. So if we are, let's say, in uh, the United States, we pray facing east, generally, meaning to say you have to fine-tune it based on how far north or south you are. Um, if a person is is praying in um, northern, north of Israel, uh, north of the Holy Land, then they have to pray facing south. And someone who's praying from Jordan is going to pray to the west, uh, towards the west. So it's very um much the focal point so how is this possible what's the significance and why are we why are we focusing in this direction is because while god almighty is everywhere we're recognizing acknowledging that god almighty said this is a point a focal point a focal point for the revelation of godliness in the world and a focal point for the service of all human beings to be focused that their day should be focused on from the moment that they open their eyes to the moment we close our eyes, it's meant to be focused on the service of God Almighty. So we do not subscribe to the idea that the service of God Almighty is a thing that we do on a list of all the other things that we have to do. So we take care of our eating, we take care of our self-care, we take care of our working, we take care of our recreation and so forth, and, the, and then... Uh, we also do some religious activities. That's not the way the Torah looks at it. The Torah looks at us and teaches us that really every single thing we do, every single breath, like King David says, in Psalm 150, the whole book of Psalms finishes with the phrase that with every single, every single soul will praise God Almighty. Every soul is going to praise God Almighty. Kol Every soul is the same word as this word for soul. It's the same word for breath. Every breath is praising God Almighty. So what we are meant to do and what we are always striving to do, and there's really an infinite levels of ability to become aware of this. So we're never, ever, ever going to be bored. Whatever we thought we accomplished yesterday, we have much more to accomplish. Even if we were able to start from yesterday's starting point, we have infinite levels of ability to see godliness, to appreciate the God Almighty, to see him in the creation, and to be able to share God Almighty's message with every single human being. But it's interesting because it was occurring to me this morning, it's like God Almighty created the world in a very interesting way, that the way the world works is we always are starting again. No matter how much progress we think we've made with the day starts, and we are starting from scratch. And while we might have some benefit from the things that we've done in the past in terms of inculcating the right attitudes or the right approach or making it more accessible by rep repetition, so if it makes things more accessible. So if I train myself to open my eyes, and the first thing I think about, even before I open my eyes, is to think about I'm grateful to God Almighty and to say, 
acknowledge do I, God Almighty, that you are the king and living and enduring king that has returned my soul to me with great compassion and great is your faithfulness. So the more I, I sort of speak, train myself to do that, it becomes more accessible to me. But we also realize that the more I do it, so I go from the halting, uh, having to remember, or oh, I forgot to say it, um, got to remind myself, I get into the habit, but then I have a new problem, which is once it becomes a habit, it's something that just flows off my lips and I don't even think about it anymore. So it's, there's no way to graduate from the service of God Almighty. There's no way to get a degree in the service of God Almighty because just when I get um, facile at it, when I just, when I get fluidity, when I get the flow, I'm now, so I now have a different challenge. Now it's just flowing so smoothly. I'm not even, it's not even registering with me. So now I have to combine the ease that with which it comes with the ability to really now focus on it in a completely new level. And an even greater level of concentration is necessary. A greater, the greatest level of um, intention is necessary because when I'm learning something from scratch, then uh, I automatically have to, you know, you're trying to thread a needle um, then you pay a lot of attention. You do it very intentionally. But once um, it's, it becomes, you know, so easy, you're not even thinking about it. Now I have to now make sure I'm thinking about it. So God Almighty's intention is that we should have every part of our life, every part of existence is meant to be focused on him. That's the only thing that exists. So we're supposed to be seeing God Almighty in every single thing that we experience, and everything that we um, that we see. So the concept of having a focal point is not in any way detracting from that. On the contrary, it's actually enhancing that awareness because we're seeing it's not just that everything is diffuse, but there is a focal point. There's a focal point of time. There's a focal point of space. There's a focal point of soul, meaning to say that we are... Um, while the whole universe is, is God Almighty's creation, and he's way beyond the universe. But there is a place in the universe which is the focal point of the service of God Almighty. A, a focus point, meaning to say, we can serve God Almighty wherever we are. We can communicate with God Almighty all the time, anytime. And we can receive answers all the time, anytime. But at the same time, we don't allow it to become so diffuse that we're, well, n there's, no, there's no real significance. There's no difference in anything. No, there is a difference. The first thing that we have to learn is how to discriminate. We have to discriminate and see and be able to um, make a, a separation between, as we said, between Kodesh and Chayil, between the holy and the things that are revealed holiness and things that are less revealed holiness. So... Just the fact that it's God Almighty is creating it and he's creating it for his glory and he's creating it for his purposes and we're supposed to recognize that, that doesn't take away from the fact that there are certain things that are more of a focal point in our service of God Almighty. So we're going to give more um, intentional, directed acknowledgement of that in the way we relate to that. So for example, if we have a Torah scroll, which is a copy handwritten copy from one copy to the next written from torah um, scribe to torah scribe from generation to generation originally written down by moses our teacher then we're going to treat that with the greatest respect we're going to see that it's extremely holy and we're going to make sure to um, take care of it and cover it and treat it with respect and not take it into improper places and not expose it to improper things and make sure when I when I say improper, even things that are just part of the way God had created us, but they're not appropriate for a Torah scroll. So we're not going to take uh, a Torah item into a bathroom, for example. We're not going to we'll dispose of it if it's no longer usable. We're not going to dispose of it in a garbage heap. We're going to recognize that it has a status that is, it is to my benefit to recognize that status. Because when I take the time and the intention, the energy to say this thing is unique and it requires my honoring it that's elevating me i'm elevated by my recognition that this is a through, with, through this holy written scroll of the torah through this is how god almighty's 
communicating to humanity. So this is something that is holy and requires to be treated as something holy. So it's really about me and my cognition, my awareness of this has a special quality. And it's different than this computer. It's different than this cloth for wiping a, a camera screen or a, 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 a glasses, even though this is created by God Almighty for his glory. He's, he's consciously creating this every single instant. Uh, we're, we're meant to be aware of that. We learn on, on, after Shabbos, we learn the gate of um, oneness and unity. So we're, we're very aware that this only exists because God Almighty is putting his creative energy into it through his, his divine speech, so to speak, into this thing right here. But at the same time, there is something about the Torah scroll which is not found in this. And that is that it is something that is carrying God's message in the world. So, so the Holy Temple, the tabernacle, which we're going to learn about now, and subsequently the Holy Temple, has that, um, has that focus. And it is to our benefit, meaning to say there's a commandment to honor the Holy Temple. And that's something that Rabbi Yonashen Steif says applies to all human beings. They have to, Meir Mikdash, to have um, awe, to be in awe of the Holy Temple is something that applies to all human beings. This is the house of prayer for all the nations. So it needs to be treated with respect now and, and honor and awe, meaning to say, for example, we're going to learn today. Uh, the different uh, um, items in the Holy Temple. And it's forbidden to make replicas of those items for our own use outside the temple. So we cannot make a, um, we're going to see, let's say, the table or the or the, um, the coverings and the menorah and, and the different items in the temple. We can't make those and say, ah, you know what? I'll just follow the instructions over here. I'm going to make those for myself put them in my synagogue. I'm going to put them in my living room. And the answer is no, we can't do that. And that applies to all human beings because every human being needs to be in awe of the fact that there is a divine instruction to at a certain time, a certain place, and certain people are responsible for stewarding it. That is what the Torah is telling us. So we said that there's a special uh, time. What's the time? Well, we see that there's different stages of the year when there's different parts of service. We're learning in the Torah the different focal points. See, we focus our energy on certain ideas at different times of the year. So right now we are starting the month of Adar, and the month of Adar is, um, we sa it says that when Adar starts, we increase in joy. So we're supposed to be joyous all the time. It says, even though it's Hashem B'Simcha, we should serve God Almighty with joy all the time comes in other, we have to increase on that. So we many places have a custom of dancing every night. There's dancing, there's music and dancing. In the Lubavitch Rebbe Synagogue on 77 Eastern Parkway in Brooklyn, there's, there's dancing and music every single night. Uh, and it increases throughout the month. And then we come to the focal point of Purim, which is a day of, you know, one of the happiest days of the year when we're rejoicing and celebrating over the miracles recorded in the Book of Esther, the Megillus Esther. So that's a focal point. Then we're going to come to Passover, and we're going to focus on the exodus of Egypt. Now, we're mentioning the exodus of Egypt every single day. Multiple times we mention the exodus of Egypt. We need to see ourselves as going out of Egypt today. It's not enough to think about it that was 3,334 years ago. It's not enough to think about it that it was, um, I remember it on pay, Passover, on Pesach, or I'm going to do it coming up Pesach, uh, Passover at Pesach. Now I have to right now experience that I'm going out of Egypt. God Almighty in his loving kindness is taking me out of Egypt. So on one hand, it's every day all the time. On the other hand, there's a time when there's seven days or in, outside, in the land of in the Holy Land and, and eight days outside the Holy Land that we only eat matzah and we, that we don't eat any leavened bread and we discuss the exodus from Egypt. So there is a concept in time of focus. And each one of the Torah portions is bringing us to focus at this point in the time on that particular point. 
So we're not allowed to say, you know what? I went through the Torah one time. I went through the Torah 10 times, 100 times, whatever it is. I got it. I got it. I got the message. I got the point, right? I, why do I have to learn the Torah again this year? I learned it last year. Why do I need to focus now on that this week's Parsha Truma, but learning about the Torah portion of building the tabernacle when I studied this last year? And not only that, the tabernacle hasn't existed for 3,000, uh, well, it was uh, just 3,200 or something years. I don't remember the exact not, date, date right now, but it's over 3,000 years, perhaps, that the tabernacle has not been in existence. At some point, it was replaced by the Holy Temple. So why do I need to learn this now? And I already learned it anyways. And maybe if a person really learned it, he knows it by heart, and he could tell you all the measurements and draw it for you with, from memory. So the answer is because we have to learn it, we have to read it. The, the Torah is instituted to be read every week in the synagogue, the relevant, the Torah portion of the week, because we need to focus. There needs to be a focus on this point. Now, within this point, there's many, many details. In fact, there's an infinite number of details. So we're never going to get tired of learning it again and again because we're going to get greater and greater insights in the infinite, why is it infinite? Because it's it's the divine. Only in something divine can you find the infinite. And there's no way to ever grasp the Torah or even uh, a part of it, because we, we can we can let it settle in our minds and our wisdom and our understanding and our knowledge. But at the same time, there's always more to learn, an infinite amount. So that's focus and time. Then there's also focus in space. Focus in space is that we have a place that is holy. A holy place. We have a holy objects. We have a holy place. We have a tabernacle. We have a holy temple. We have today synagogues where there's a holiness because people gather together to pray to God Almighty. A base medrash where people come to learn Torah. We're, we're doing we call the base medrash here. We're learning on Zoom. But... It, it, we, but that when we learn in person in a physical space, we are elevating that. And when a person builds his home, according to Torah, they're also turning that into a place that is sanctified, that is being elevated. It's not just another house. It's not like a shelter that, uh, you know, beavers make lodges, right? Fantastic. They, they have everything we have. But they have shelter, they have a place for storage, they have all these different, the basic things that we have in our houses, they have also. But there's a difference, because when we build a house and we bring God Almighty into the house, we put a mezuzah on the door, and we learn Torah in the house, and we conduct ourselves appropriately according to the way God Almighty wants someone created in his divine image to conduct themselves, that we're, we're patient, we're loving, we're not angry, we are supportive we are learn we're teaching and emulating and, and providing an example at all times and bringing new children into the world in the divine god almighty's divine image then that is elevating our house it becomes a miniature tabernacle as we're going to see and not miniature in the sense to to um to minimize its significance in fact it is extremely significant significant because each one of these homes is the building blocks of civilization it's the building blocks of of revealing godliness in the world. And then we have the concept of the focal point in, in the soul. So we learn that there's different aspects of the soul and there's different aspects of where Rabbi Chirik is teaching um, the definitions from the Shari Yuchud, uh, the gate of oneness that we learn on Thursday nights. And there's five levels to the soul and each one has a different expression of godliness. And then there are, within the Jewish people, there are the priests that they have a special role and special responsibility. And there's the Levim that have a tribe of Levi that has a special responsibility. And there is the, the, the commoners among the Jewish people from the other tribes. They have a special responsibility. And then the, among the, the Jewish people have a responsibility in the world as a whole. And the, then there's the world of human beings that have an essential responsibility. Each one of them has a, a, a focal point of civilizing the world and, and establishing the world according to God Almighty's law. So 
this is how we have to understand it. So when we learn about the tabernacle, we cannot just be saying, and we're not meant to be just saying, okay, I'm learning about the tabernacle. The holiness is over there in this thing that we're being that's being described to us. We must learn it in the context of the entire creation, that the entire creation is God Almighty's creation with a purpose, and everything that we're doing has a purpose and has we're meant to be aligned or or conscious or or attuned to or intending towards that purpose in everything that we do and we are also recognizing that this the people are intended the space is intended and the time is intended and therefore we can align ourselves when we're learning this to realize that the whole world is implicated in this discussion that we are each a microcosm of what we're learning here and that when we learn about the tabernacle we're meant to apply it to ourselves and we're meant to apply it to the world and then learn both from from our intention and our direction we are able then to bring the world to the rebuilding of the holy temple to the restoration of the service in the holy temple for the benefit of every single human being that's what we are able to do so we're learning about it not as a historical thing, although there is a historical component. We're learning about it as a personal experience, and we're learning about it as a future experience for the entire world. So let's uh, delve in. So we're in chapter 25 of the book of Exodus, and God Almighty says to Moses, speak to the Jewish people and take the materials, donate what's necessary for the their personal contribution personal items to become a contribution for god almighty and like it says over here tell the, that they should take a contribution from, for god almighty from every man whose heart prompts him to give meaning to say there are different aspects of giving there is a machsis a shekel is a half shekel which is a form of currency that every person had to give and then there's additional items which a person could give on top of that so everyone is able to, um, everyone is able to contribute a basic amount that applies to everyone equally. And actually, we're going to see those became the foundation, the silver um, foundation footings for the pillars in the temple that form the wall. And at the same time, people could give as much as they want in addition to that. So in verse three, God Almighty says. The, the gold, the silver, the copper, all that they had from the spoils of Egypt and from the sea of reeds that they collected from the adorned chariots and horses of the Egyptians that pursued them into the sea. And then those Egyptians uh, and their horses drowned in the sea when God Almighty returned the sea to its original state. So, and they washed up on the shore. There was a tremendous amount of wealth. That's how the Egyptians went to battle. They, they didn't just focus on the military part of it. There was a whole experience of, of adorning themselves with gold and so forth, and their animal, the horses and, the, and the, um, the chariots. So then we see what the, the turquoise wool and the wool dyed purple and the wool dyed scarlet and, and the, and the um, linen, the goat hair, Red dyed ram skins, and the skins of atachash, um, and acacia wood, and olive oil, and spices for the incense offering, and onk stones and incense stones, and for the ephod, and the um, the the chesion, um, the ephod, and the chesion, which the high priest wore. So every type of material, both things that are mistranslated as inanimate, but things that are um, really just means silent. The word in Hebrew is doimim. They're silent. They're not inanimate, meaning to say everything is animated with God Almighty's creative energy. But these things are silent. They don't express it. So those are the stones and so forth. And then you have the things that come from the plants, from the tzameach, from the growing things, the vegetations. And you have things that come from the animals. You have things that are from the chaya. So God Almighty says they must make for me a sanctuary. And it says over here in verse 8, And you will, they will make for me a, a sanctuary, and I will dwell in them. 
And so the word says in them, it doesn't, it should say in it. So the word in them is meaning to refer that in the process of our contribution to the Holy Temple, we are all actually making our own temple. We are, we are each one of us is a sanctuary for God Almighty. Each one of us is a place where God Almighty is able to dwell because we work on aligning ourselves and bringing ourselves into orders that it's going to be in ourselves a sanctuary for God Almighty. So he's dwelling in each one of us. And then he says in verse 9, according to the God Almighty says, all that I will show you the form of the tabernacle and the form of all its furnishings. So there's many different components of the tabernacle. I'm just going to show you, hold up this here, this picture, um, because it just give you a little bit of a of, um, ability to get a little bit of a grasp of it. So over here, you can see, this is the general picture here. You have the outer courtyard here going around, and then you have the inner structure over here, which is um, the actual tabernacle itself. And then you have in front of it, the altar. So this is now in a close-up over here. You have an altar over here, and then you have over here the washing stand, and then you have in here, this is the um, tabernacle itself, and you have the outer area where you have the menorah, the candelabra, you have the um, table, the shulchan, and you have here the um, altar for the incense offerings. Now in here, there's now a curtain at this level, this becomes, this is called the holies here. This is the holies, and this is the holy of holies. And in here is the Ark of the Covenant. And in the Ark of the Covenant is the um, tablets that God Almighty had Moses carve out on, um, or that were carved on Mount Sinai. And uh, the Ten Commandments are on those. And also um, a Torah scroll later on. Um, and then the broken commandments that God, that Moses broke when he came down from Mount Sinai the first time were also included there. There's different, we can discuss later the details of it. So, um, so now back, so we start here in uh, chapter 25, the ark. So the ark is um, made of acacia wood. And we have the dimensions here in, in the verse 10. And then it says, you must overlay it with pure gold. You must have them overlay it inside and outside. So it's interesting, I saw Rabbi Victor Miller was saying a, a beautiful talk where he said that we can learn from this, that first it starts with covering the ark on the outside with gold, and then on the inside with gold second. And that the concept he brought out from this is that we sometimes have to work on our externalities first before we can actually really penetrate into our internalities, meaning to say, we have, he brings a story about the Lubavitch Rebbe that someone came to the Lubavitch Rebbe and complained. He believes the story was told about the previous Lubavitch Rebbe, that Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak, that uh, someone came and complained to the, this, the Lubavitch Rebbe that his students were uh, showing themselves to be very pious, but they were kind of faking it. And they weren't as pious as they made themselves out to be. So the Lubavitch Rebbe answered him that it says in the Torah teachings that someone who fakes uh, that he is uh, poor in order to collect charity. For example, let's say he pretends to have uh, be an amputee, God forbid, by folding up his leg, or he pretends to be have some sort of you know disease or so forth, and he does that in order to collect charity. Then it's the, the Torah teachings are that he will, in some point in his life, he'll actually come to that state because he misled people into falsely presenting himself as in being in need. So the 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 Lubavitch Rebbe said, so too, if someone fakes that he is pious, and he fakes that he is really God fearing, and really a lover of his fellow, then it's a prom it's promised that he for sure will in his lifetime come to that state of being. So it's okay if his students are faking being more pious than they really are, because that is going to bring them to actually be pious. So Rabbi Victor Miller brings this out. It connects it to this week's Torah portion and to this concept of the Ark. The Ark represents where the Ten Commandments are carried, where the uh, the, the um, luches, the tablets are carried. This is like the center focal point of the service of God Almighty. And it is not only okay to fake it, 
it's actually required to fake it. That's what he was pointing out. So a person has to fake it until he's able to bring his insides around to actually uh, f follow the example until the gold, the gold on the outside looks good and it is good and it's he's speaking nicely and he's acting nicely, but his insides are still not caught up to that. So Rabbi Victor Miller says that it will come, it will catch up. He will then be able to work on his insides to catch up to where his outsides are. In. And he says, brings different examples of that, how a person should make sure to say nice things to people and be grateful for them, even if they're in a internally harboring some sort of um, discomfort and distaste with the other person. They should do nice things for them and they should say nice things to them because that is how we're meant to serve God Almighty. We're meant to fake it so that we can actually be doing God Almighty's will in the world. And then we will actually transform our insides that the insides will come along even reluctantly to actually be mirroring what our outsides look like. And he says, this is the wonderful things about Rabbanus. This is one of the things about being a rabbi is a rabbi. When you're a rabbi, you have to, you have to fake it that you are on a higher level and you're, you're attuned to all these things because that's what you need to do. But he says that has a benefit because then you have the insides eventually come along. And Rabbi Avigdor Miller, who was a great, great righteous man, he said, I myself can speak to, to testify to how this works, that it works for me. He need to say that he, he's saying that by, by being forced to, to act in a way that's, that's kind and thoughtful and, and, and uh, comports with the externalities of being uh, a righteous rabbi, that gives him the push that now the outside is like that. Now his insides have to follow along. So I thought it was a beautiful statement for him to say, because he's saying that with a great amount of humility, but you have to relate to each, we're all human beings. And there's, and, and we could, he's saying, don't, don't discard this. So this person is just a faker. If he's faking good things, that's an amazing thing. We should all be faking good things. We should all be faking being in a good mood. We should all be faking being happy. We should all fake having something nice to say about somebody else. We should also have to be faking to be willing and interested in helping another person out because that, our Miller is saying, is that's what's going to bring our insides along. We're not meant to wait until we feel like it until we feel ready, until we feel like, oh, I can't, I'm really internally enthusiastic and feeling these all these positive feelings. No, we're supposed to externally act the way we would if we had those internal feelings. And then the internal feelings will come along, the internal polishing, the internal shining will come along as a result of having created this external um, faking, as he calls it. And he says that at they, they, when they published it, they said at the end, they, every person should make a list of three things every day that they're going to fake it. They're going to um, go ahead and, and fake three things in the being kind to other people, smiling, even though they're not doing something nice for another person, doing something that not, they don't really feel like doing for another person. That is going to bring, that's what God Almighty wants. And that's going to bring about a person to change inside. And that should not be dismissed because if a person is doing that, he is really uplifting the world and he will himself become uplifted in the process. So it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful lesson, a moving lesson to see how we need to make sure. He's, and he says also, by the way, just as interesting, he says, we have to make sure the Torah does not promote being natural. We're supposed to be, natural is, if I'm not feeling in a good mood, act like I'm not in a good mood. That's being natural. The Torah wants us to be unnatural. I'm not feeling in a good mood. I have to act like I'm in a good mood. And he, he brings us an example. He says, what, what does it look like being natural? A guy's sitting in a bus stop and he puts his finger in his ear to, to clean out his ears and then he examines what's on his finger. So he says, that's, that's what natural looks like. That's not how a human being should conduct themselves. We are meant to be, God Almighty wants us to refine our thought, our speech and action to reflect not necessarily where we're really holding inside, but to that the commandments are to act in a ways that we're not even ready for. We're really faking it. 
And then that will bring along the insides and the insides will shine and be golden like the outside. So I, I see over here, someone is writing a, uh, a, a message over here. This is very startling. I'm shocked, but he's also smiling. So, um, but this, this is the, the reality of, of, of life and, and what God Almighty wants from us. He wants our, us to be internally right, but we've got to be right externally, even when the internally is not yet ready. So that's what we learned from the ark. First, we cover it with gold from the outside, and we, then we cover it from gold from the inside. And, and Rabbi Miller brought another point, is that the wood is in the middle. When you have the gold in the inside, and then you get the gold in the inside, uh, on the outside, I'm sorry, and then you put the gold in the inside, then you can permanently create a permanent state of the service of God Almighty. So, because the, the wood becomes preserved when it's completely co covered in gold, it's going to become um, permanent. Okay, so that's uh, something to learn out. And we can see, every, we, don't, we don't have time to go into every detail, but every part of the details has a lesson for us in the service of God Almighty. And there's really an infinite level, infinite number of these lessons that we can learn. And that's why we are meant to spend time where we're supposed to be laboring in the Torah to be able to bring out more and more insights and to share with other people. And every human being has, has, has to learn the lessons that apply to them to make sure that they are taking this message of hope for every single human being. And it's interesting that, that the whole modern movement, just to follow up what Robert Miller is saying, the whole modern movement is you have to say what you're thinking, you have to say what you're feeling. People go to therapy and they they say everything that every thought they have and they share it with their spouse or they share it with other people. And the end result is it creates a disaster. I know they're saying, no, there, we don't, we don't, sh all this, this uh, unready state inside, this state that's not yet ready and fully in tune with the service of God Almighty is irrelevant. That's not where we're supposed to be living. And that's not where we're supposed to be focused on. We're supposed to, we're not supposed to, just, and if we have it and we're stuck with it, or we feel we're stuck with it, and we're, we're, we're entrenched in it at this moment, that's no one else's business. We're not supposed to be now dumping on that someone else. We have to be working on the externalities and making sure that we are conducting ourselves in the way that God Almighty wants us to weigh, uh, conduct ourselves in a way that's going to be positive and uplifting for ourselves and those around us. So then we have the cover of the ark. We have the cheruvin. Um the, the Kruvim over here are these, uh, you can see over here in the picture, are on the top of the ark, on the top of the cover of the ark, two uh, small figures that with wings spread aloft and they're facing each other. Um, and God Almighty says in verse 22, I, these are these these are not just accessories, but I will convene you with there. I will speak to you from above the cover. From the my voice will come from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony. Everything I will command you concerning the Jewish people. Uh, then there's the table, which held these twelve loaves of special unleavened bread. It looks like this over here. You can see in the this picture over here. It's a whole structure of the table which you could examine in more detail sorry i'm going fast so fast yeah people are looking at the screen here see over here so that looks like then we have in verse 31 of chapter 25 we have the menorah the candelabra and this is uh, something that we all are familiar with, at least in some general concept, because we everyone knows about Hanukkah and the menorah that we like on Hanukkah. But the difference here is that the, the menorah in the temple, the Holy the Tabernacle in the Holy Temple, had seven branches. So Hanukkah has eight branches. Because this milit the, the miracle of Hanukkah related to the fact that the oil burned on the seven branched menorah for miraculously burned for eight days. So therefore we build it with eight. But also we have a commandment that we cannot 
responsibility not to emulate the vessels of the temple. So we couldn't, we, we shouldn't be building seven branched menorahs. We build the for Hanukkah, we build the eighth branch menorah, but we don't build the seventh branch menorah. So there's many, many details of the menorah. I'm just going to focus on, on one point over here is that the menorah was not built to provide light for the inside the, the tabernacle itself. Rather, the menorah is built to provide light to the entire world. And in fact, when the temple was built, the windows were built in a way that they were narrower in the inside and wider in the outside. The purpose being, normally people have, when you build a, a building stone, you build them narrow on the outside and wider on the inside to allow more light to come in and spread into more space by making it wider in the inside, you're going to get more spreading of light within the space that you, you are trying to bring light into. But in the in the um, temple, holy temple, the windows were built narrow on the inside and wider on the outside because the real intention of the light from the menorah is to bring light to the entire world. And in fact, King Solomon what built in the uh, create uh, um, constructed an additional ten menorahs in addition to the one that was placed in the holies. In the Kodesh of the, in the Heichel of the uh, Beis Amikdash of the Temple, Holy Temple, he created and built another um, 10 menorahs. Why? Because 10 menorahs with seven branches each is 70, which represents the 70 nations of the world. Meaning to say the light, to indicate that the light of the, of the menorah in the Holy Temple, in the Holy City, in the Holy Land, is meant to reach every single human being in the world. So the, the, you can learn here in more detail um, how it's the, the whole process of it and what it looks like and so forth. But just want to pay, make the person understand that, that these vessels in the Holy Temple are meant to be of service to the entire world, meaning to say that the message of the Temple, the, the um, message of hope for humanity from the Holy Temple is meant to be inspiring all of us and, the, and every single human being. Then we have in chapter 26, starts with the coverings of the tabernacle. So it was not a permanent structure. It was not made of stone. It was had wood in it for the um, certain parts of the structure. But the main, the main covering of it, what you would call the walls, were these, uh, or the roof was, were these, um, were these coverings made of these different types of wools. Um, and you can read about this in chapter 26. It has all the details, the sizes, every, every single detail. And you can see over here, there's different layers. I'll just hold up this picture over here. You can see there's different layers of the wool material and then the animal skin material. Okay, so then you have the building itself, the structure, you have different instructions as to the wooden columns that are used, and then this, the silver bases for those that so they were inserted in them, and they would stand, and then they're held together also at the top. And the uh, rings and the crossbars that were used to keep all the pillars in line and together. And then we have over here the curtain that was put in to separate between the holy and the holy of holies. See over here in this illustration, bottom of this page. And then there's a description of the different elements, the different um, tools that were used in the um, creation of the, uh, in the service. So this is the instructions I'm making on here. I'm sorry for the, uh, I'm working in reverse. So it's, uh, which page am I on? Okay, there we go. Okay, and then here is a picture of the altar. This here is the outer altar.
And this is relevant because non-Jews are also allowed to bring a korban oila, a korban oila to the holy temple to be offered in the holy temple. So the, the temple literally served as a focal point for the service of God Almighty, not only as in terms of prayer that we described before, but also in terms of, it, of bringing animal sacrifices. And it talks also about in the times of Mashiach is going to come, the redemption is going to come, and the rebuilding of the third temple is going to be all human beings are going to come uh, to, the, to the holy temple. And then finally, in the end of the Torah portion, it talks about the courtyard that was built in the um, um, courtyard was built in the Mishkan. So this is the discussion today. We're going to see this. the Torah portions um, are going to return, discuss in the future the um, construction of this and all the details again, how it was done. Now, next week's Torah portion is going to start talking about the priestly garments, and we'll go through that next week. And I want to open the floor for any discussions but before uh, and comments and questions. But before we do that, I just want to emphasize the point that we mentioned in passing about the concept of focal points of time, that we are now standing two weeks before uh, Purim. And we it's important to start speaking about it and start learning about it and remembering that this is a lesson for every single human being. Purim, you know, there's a, there's a tendency... Uh, to talk about things as being Jewish holidays. And it's it's all true that they're Jewish holidays in the sense that they're Torah holidays, but they're not just holidays for the Jewish people. I mean, to say Purim is the saga about the battle in the, the cosmic battle that Amalek was engaged in to try to commandeer the non-Jewish people into first annihilating god forbid the jewish people and then annihilating themselves which was his ultimate goal of haman and of amalek and which continues to this day that the goal while they first rile the non-jews up against the jews and kind of isolate them and, and try to uh, god forbid move against the jewish people but that's all a preparatory move once the those carrying the message in the world that they're here um cre created in God, every human being is created in God Almighty's image. Once that message, the messengers, the, the, the what those bearing witness to God Almighty's existence are sidelined or worse in the world, then the whole world is now susceptible to losing sight of what its purpose is. Every human being doesn't realize anymore that he's created in God Almighty's image. And then he is now susceptible to the 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 torture and eventual elimination by Amalek. So we have to recognize that this is really about the non-Jews, and it's about the influence on the non-Jews, and that when the Jewish people are influencing the non-Jews, then they are not susceptible to the influence of Amalek. They can't be captured, so to speak. When, when the non-Jew is left uh, without the di divine message of hope that the Torah is transmiss transmitting, then like any human being who's left with that, it become rudderless and they could be susceptible to any suggestion that seems to make sense for the moment. And that's what a Malik does. It persuades people to come to its side to by, by different su suggestions that this is going to be good for the person and free them up from any kind of uh, restrictions and obligations and then leads them to um, eventually to self-destruct. So our job is to recognize that. And Mordechai was saying to the Jewish people, don't give up on this role. Don't go to assimilate. Don't just give up on the rebuilding of the Holy Temple just because the 70 years passed that was promised for the rebuilding of the Holy Temple prophesied. No, stick to what we know. We have the job, we have the responsibility, and we need to do it with joy. And that's why other is such a joyous time because our job is to recognize that the way to break through the boundaries with, is with joy. It's not just that joy feels better. And it's not just that joy is meant to be something we should be in because we're grateful for everything we have. But joy is something that we must inculcate in ourselves, even as Rabbi Miller was saying, to the extent of faking it, because we need it to be able to break through the boundaries. We need to be able to break through the limitations of the exile. And that is with joy. 
and, and all the XL is both the general XL that we find ourselves in as human beings and also as the XL of the Jewish people and the XL of each individual person that we are in our own individual XLs. To break out of that, we must be joyous now as if we're already redeemed from that XL. And that itself is, that's, that joy indicates the certainty that we're going to be redeemed and it propels the redemption and may we experience it in its totality, both the individual and the general redemption, speedily now. Any questions? I have two questions, Rabbi. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Go ahead. I was wondering if you thought maybe um, the word korban and carbon are related. And now we can see that there is a push to... Uh, uh, say that carbon is an atmospheric pollutant and all these sorts of things. Uh, and maybe they want to ban fire and all these things. So I would suggest maybe it's possible. Um, they really want to ban the offering. And so uh, saying that carbon is an atmospheric pollutant could really just be an excuse for that. And the second question is about uh, the altar. It looks a lot like a castle. Um, do you have any comments about that or any tradition about that? Okay, so as to the first question, the goal is to extinguish the human presence in the world because the human presence in the world represents the divine presence in the world. And the divine presence is only found if there's human beings. So the goal is to restrict and eliminate any form of impact of human beings on the world. And burning fire is the first thing that human beings did. It says that fire was taught to Adam and Eve on the, after Shabbos was over. Uh, after the end of Shabbos, on the, the seventh day, when God Almighty rested from the creation of the world, and now they were coming back to the first day, the first day of the next week, and God Almighty was sending them out from the Garden of Eden. So they were now going into the darkness of the world and they needed fire. So fire is, is integrally related with the presence of human beings in this world. So this concept of, of reducing um, human impact in the world, which is related to carbon, the carbon footprint and the carbon this and the carbon that, and the carbon created by, which already exists, but there, it's, I mean, the, the, we're not creating the carbon. The carbon exists um, in the trees that are being burnt or the fuel that's being burnt. And now it's being, it's, its form is changing from one form to the other, uh, which then is recycled by plants that grow in and, and integrate it and, and bring more beneficial life into the world. So there's no danger from the carbon. But to your question of the, um, relationship of the words. That's a very good question. I haven't thought about that. And uh, I don't know the etymology of them, and, but it's it's interesting because the word Corbin in the Holy Language, in Lashon HaKadosh, in the Holy Tongue, is, means to lekarev, to draw close. And it really, a Corbin, the animal sacrifice is the process of us drawing ourselves close to God Almighty. We're saying, I want to be close to you. And there's different carbonus, there's different animal sacrifices for different purposes, but some of them are for the purpose of having strayed away from God Almighty. I want to come closer. I want to bring myself, really, I want to bring myself to a complete inclusion in God Almighty, but I am meant to stay alive in this world. So I'm bringing this animal in my place. Um, there's carbonus that are brought as regular sacrifices and so forth. Um, and uh, sacrifices of thanksgiving and so forth. It's all about coming close to God Almighty. So it's interesting that the carbon, ca carbon, however, the English word for the carbon is, is it's uh, one of the building blocks, the elemental building blocks of living things. And all living things represent a higher expression of godliness over the inanimate, which is less revealed the, the godliness in it. So um, it's just something to, to explore more. We'll see what, what comes about it. If you find anything, let me know. As to the um, 
as to the castle, and by the way, just in, the, in terms of the building of the tabernacle and this concept, you see that all these elements that are used in the creation of the tabernacle, meaning to say all these living things, all these animals, all these animal products, let's say the skin and stuff like that, all these living things, the vegetation that was used for the, um, or both the wool, another product of living things, and the vegetation is used so forth in the temp holy temple for the dyes and for the uh, incense offerings indicates that the highest fulfillment of purpose of anything that in existence is in the service of God Almighty. And it's a human being that's able to reveal that and bring those things elevated to another level, to the level of serving God Almighty and revealing that service of God Almighty, that that is what the Torah is teaching us. So we can't let ourselves get distracted or sidelined by any of the ideologies that come to war against Almighty God Almighty, which are not new. This has been going on for thousands of years these arguments against the service of God Almighty. Um, we need to, to make sure to stand strong and say what's clearly correct and what the Torah says. Now, in terms of the point about the construction of the altar, uh, that it rem reminds you of a castle, um, I haven't seen anything about that, and I, I'm curious, and if you find anything, please let me know. Any other questions? Okay, um, my question is about the um, faking. Um, yes. And if, I mean, I, I understand why faking can lead to uh, the actual thing, but that has been the problem. As um, if I could bring something from first century uh, Jewish writings. Um, some Christian call it in uh, you know New Testament, but this is I think it's important. Um, the teachers of the law was um, um, chastised in a way, and so it, 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 they were called the hypocrites. You give tens of your spices, mint, dill, cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law: justice, mercy. Uh, faithfulness you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former so faking is good if you can get to the real thing but obviously it wasn't in the first century and um, the fact that Romans um, um, destroyed the, the holy temple you could say that the reason was there so how can we achieve now, uh, as we all look towards the third temple, how can we um, mitigate hypocrisy? So first of all, where, are you, where were you reading from? What were you quoting from? Uh, it, it's from Matthew um, 24, from 20, verse 23 to 24. Okay, so you don't need to turn to Matthew to learn this lesson. In fact, the prophet Isaiah says that God rejects fake yeah. offerings that are bring you're bringing the offerings, but then you won't lend to the poor, you won't clothe the, the widow and the orphan. So the, the hypocrisy is something that the God Almighty is speaking directly through Isaiah the prophet, and, and we see that. So that's there's a that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about being hypocritical. Mm. The actions should be the right actions in all times. But where Miller is bringing out is the point is bring out the right actions, do the right thing. All the things that the Torah is telling us to do, all the things that Isaiah is, is complaining that we're not doing, all those things we should be doing, even if our insides are not really quite not, not enthusiastic about it. It says, love your fellow as yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say you're not up to any love for him yet. Maybe you can't stand him. Okay, so you have an obligation to learn to love him and develop a fiery love for every single person. But right now you're not feeling it. Maybe not only you, maybe you feel it for people in general, but for him, he just came and he did something, he stepped on your toe or he insulted you. So now how are you going to act towards him? You, the, you need to act towards him. The Torah says you cannot take revenge. You cannot go ahead and... Um, you cannot go ahead and, and say, oh, I'm, I'm not going to take revenge on you. Really, you did this wrong to me, but I'm not going to be like you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the right thing. There's, there's commandments. You can't speak bad about him. There's commandments against uh, uh, speaking about his negativity, negativity is 
Uh, for sure, you can't say false things about him, but you can't even say true things about him that are just going to disparage him. And you have to act like you really love him. So don't, don't you know, throw him out of your life. Don't do things that are going to make him, dis humiliate him, disparage him, and so forth. You have to act in a loving way. So we're not talking about hypocrisy. You don't need to wear, you don't need to wear around the sign saying, I'm not in the mood to like you today. It's not hypocritical to act like you like the person and say, I, I'm so happy to see you when you're and you look great today. And I'm glad to have you here when you're not really feeling that. Because we're meant to. Now, we're not doing it out of flattery, because flattery itself is a prohibition. So we're not saying false things in order to flatter the person. But we are speaking like a mensch. Inside, I may not feel like a mensch. I might feel all kinds of hostility. But outside, I have to conduct myself like God Almighty wants me to. So on the contrary, it's a completely different situation than what Prophet Isaiah is referring to what you're quoting from because it's it's the those the situations of prophet isaiah is that people were that he was referring to and he was he was rebuking people for was that they were their actions were not comporting with what god almighty wants they were being super pious but not really fulfilling god's will but as we started with the story of the lubavitch rebbe that if a person is at really doing the right things and he looks really pious but he, he's not as pious yet as he appears, but that's a good thing because he's eventually going to become as pious as he appears and even more pious. He's going to be more dedicated to God Almighty. So that's not, that's not hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is when you're saying one thing and you're doing, doing the opposite, actually. Or you're doing it inconsistently. That's, that's where, where the problem is. But if you're consistently saying the, the good things and you're saying the right things, you're consistently doing the right things, then what we're saying, what the Rabbi Miller is saying is don't give up on that just because your insides are not enthusiastic about it and your insides might be screaming in the opposite direction. Okay? You have what to work on, but do the right thing. Say the right thing. Thank you for the question. It's interesting. Is it okay to carry on? Sure. Um, well, we just read Mishra Tim last week, and what you addressed is uh, come from it. And, and um, these things need to be erovolated. Um, one of the questions I had in the previous parasha was that um, um, you shouldn't hate your fellow in your heart and you need to rebuke it. But how do you how do you rebuke it? It's not quite straightforward just reading parasha. You need to bring um, uh, rabbinic teaching into it. So that's one thing. But when we move on to Truma, it goes five chapters or five parasha, how to build Mishkan. That's quite uh, detailed and it can be let's say dry if you don't understand the reason for it 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 is difficult passage to read so why is that case well first of all the rabbinic teachings are an integral part of the torah it's a it's a myth of christianity to try to say there's the written torah has the authority and the rabbinic teachings can be all uh, ignored the rabbinic teachings are no less author authoritative than the written teachings. In fact, the oral Torah precedes the written Torah. The oral transmission of the Torah precedes the written Torah. The, oral, the Torah was transmitted orally from the times of Adam, the first man. What, what Christianity tries to do is it tries to reject the entire oral tradition from the times of Adam and then disparage it by saying, well, it's just some rabbis. And they somehow then claim that they have a claim to the written Torah, which they can only understand by accepting what the rabbis say the words mean and what the vowelizations are, because there's no vowelizations in the Torah. The only way we know what the vowels are is because the rabbis have the oral tradition as to what it is. 
So they, they, they're they walking around with a written book that's translated based on the tradition of the rabbis carry lovingly from generation to generation for the benefit of the entire world. And then they reject the rabbis and say, well, that's just a rabbinic teaching. So that's that's something meant to keep humanity. That, that idea to discard the oral teachings of the Torah is a attempt to keep humanity in the dark. And they're successful at it. They keep humanity in the dark. Humanity understands, even those that study the Bible, they understand one, one millionth of what the Torah is saying because they can't access everything that is was never meant to be written down and couldn't ever possibly be written down. There's not enough paper and ink and trees in the world. Talking about you know cutting trees. There's not enough trees in the world to record everything that's in the oral Torah. So we have to recognize that the Torah is a shorthand. The written Torah is a shorthand transmission of, of, of as part of the entire Torah. The, the, the God Almighty transmitted the entire Torah to Moses, our teacher on Mount Sinai. And then he said to him, write down this shorthand summary. And the rest you're going to transmit orally. So that's why the nuances can only be learned. Many of the details can only be learned in the oral tradition, in the oral Torah. And many of the nuances, and all the nuances can only be learned in the oral Torah. There's an infinite number of nuances. So that's number one. So the Torah has to be learned in the context of the entire Torah. The entire Torah is the entire teachings of God Almighty to humanity through Adam, Hanach, Hanach, Shem, Noach, Shem, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Uh, Shem also had a grandson, Aver. They together had a yeshiva, Shem, Aver, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the leaders of the Jewish people in every generation, the teachers of Torah in every generation. That's, that's how the Torah is transmitted. So it's difficult for some people who are coming from a Christian background because when they start to learn Torah, they're confused because they've been, they're carrying with them this idea that, okay, the written Torah has an authority, but what does this rabbi have to offer? No, the Torah was given through a rabbi on Mount Sinai. God Almighty speaks through the rabbis in every generation, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and, and each one of the heads of the tribes and each one of the great rabbis in every generation, that's and, and the ones that have devoted their lives and still devote their lives to the studying and loving, nurturing and transmission of the Torah from generation to generation, including giving up their lives to make sure not even one detail gets changed so that the whole world has preserved it today in a completely untouched, unadulterated, un diluted Torah of divine wisdom for the entire world, that's what the that's what the rabbis are busy doing. That's where the wisdom is. The wisdom is in the written Torah, but it's carried by the rabbis. The book on the shelf is not speaking to humanity. It's the rabbis who open the book, open the Torah scroll. They teach the Torah scroll. They read the Torah scroll. They lovingly teach it to humanity. That's where the divine wisdom resides. And that's what the, the, the Zechariah in chapter 8, verse 23 says that in the, in the time to come, God Almighty says, so says the Lord of hosts, that 10 from among the nations are going to come and grab the fringes, the tzitzis of the Jewish man and say, we know God Almighty is with you. We want to go with you. That the, the, the concealment, the shroud of, of, of deception that has been placed on the world will be lifted and people will one by one start to realize this rabbi is carrying God Almighty's mission, wisdom and it has the instructions for every single human being at every single moment, for every single breath. I want to learn that. So that's what's going to happen. That's it's, it's, all, it's all starting to that whole uh, attempt to try to separate the world from its own teachers, which is what Christianity has done, is 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 coming to an end. That whole attempt to separate is falling apart because people are starting to realize that the Torah is carried by individual rabbis. There's not an organization for the transmission of the Torah. The Jewish people as an organic whole have that responsibility. And every non-Jew is going to come to find 
the one that he is able to connect to and grab onto his tits and say, Rabbi, I know God Almighty is with you. I want to come with you. That's what the world is going to look like. All 8 billion human beings are going to be finding their rabbi. Now, in terms of the second point, which is a question, which is about the um, the apparent dryness of these architectural instructions and so forth. Um, yes, on one hand, it's less dramatic than the splitting of the sea, the giving of the Ten Commandments, the the account of the found forming of the Jewish people, and the, the later battles and the the different circumstances that happen in the travels to the desert and so forth is less riveting in that sense but on the other hand it is the detailed transmission of the architectural plans for the house of prayer for all the nations this is this matters to us and it matters to us in a general sense that this is how it's supposed to look like and how it's supposed to be built but it also matters to us because once we understand it's, it's a model it's a blueprint for how we're supposed to build ourselves then it's it's eminently eminently relevant and engrossing. Now, the fact of the matter is, the reason I'm not engrossed in it, and the reason I want to skip over it is because I'm not really interested in the details of building myself. What I really want is I want to like have a high and lofty experience. It feels very good and proclaim all kinds of nice proclamations, but to actually go through every detail, work on every single character trait and make sure that I'm building the, what core, part, the parts of my soul and parts of my existence that correspond to each part of the temple and of the of the tabernacle and to really build on it and to work on it and to polish it and bring the pieces together and, and try again and it fell apart the first time and try again 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 until like maybe get some uh progress and and hopefully build from there that's extremely tedious that's every day's life so i, I want to skip that i want to get to that like you know i just want to like have that high but that's not what life is about the life is not about the high the life is about the tedious experience what do you think prayer is is what's more tedious than prayer getting up in the morning saying the same words i said yesterday and to refocus my mind and my heart to have not only the same experience i had yesterday but scrap the experience i had yesterday because that's irrelevant now doesn't exist anymore i'm meant to have a completely new experience all over again, I'm starting completely from scratches as, a, as if I never prayed, prayed again. And as I said before at the beginning, it may be I prayed it earlier, so now I the words are flying through my mouth, but I'm not paying attention to them anymore. So my work, my struggle to make it meaningful and relate to it and grow from it is harder than it was when I didn't even, I was breaking my teeth trying to say the words. So we want to skip those things. We want to have holy experiences. We want to have, oh, wow, this is so wonderful. And life is so wonderful and everything's so good and I, I, I'm so holy. That's why we want to skip to that. But the Torah is coming to tell us, no, there's tedious details. And to have the ultimate fulfillment of having a building that's going to endure, which is a building of the holy temple, a building of civilization, a building of each one of us individually, you have to know there are details. And we have to attend to the details. We have to attend to the details in our thinking to be open to divine wisdom and then to understand it and, and go through the details, which is called Bina, Hochman and Bina. We have to integrate it into our lives that it create, it builds emotional attributes and character traits and love and awe and, and compassion and endurance and splendor and creating a foundation of ourselves and then nobility and, and communication to others. We have to, there's, have to go through all those details. So the Torah is slowing us down and saying, pay attention now. It may seem I'm saying this five different ways or three different ways and saying it again and again and going through these details, but this is meant to be a lesson that this is that these are the real details of life. And the real, de the real details of the service of God Almighty this, and, and the building of ourselves to be in service of God Almighty and in service of our fellow human being. So thank you for the great questions. We're going to continue with Hashem. Tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock in New York time, we have the um, faith, the moon of faith in action tomorrow night, the gate of oneness, and uh, some short words in the Parsha. And then after Shabbos, we have Yeshiva Shem Be'eber learning the uh, gate of unity and faith. And then Sunday morning, learning Rabbi Shtaif, Mitzvah Hashem, 7 a.m. 
the divine commandments that are meant to lovingly guide every single human being. So thank you for joining us and we'll see you soon. Thank you very much, Rafa. You're very welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. God bless you all. And Have a good night. Yes, thank you to you for joining and thank you for everyone who's here live and thank you for everyone who's watching this gun later on. Make sure to like the video, share with other people, subscribe, spread, spread the message of hope. God Almighty's invested his time and energy into creating you and creating each one of us every second from new. And he's invested himself in providing a manual for us on how to live life according to his instructions in a way that we are knowing that we're on the right track and, and contributing to God Almighty's vision and to the well-being of every human being. And the more people we can spread this to, the faster we will bring about the ultimate fulfillment of God Almighty's vision and the well-being of every human being with the coming of the ship and the ultimate redemption of the entire humanity. God bless you all.